Hey, good evening. Hi, Steve. Hey, good evening. How are you? We're good. How are you doing? I'm a little bright. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> well, it still looks good. Your lighting's better than mine. <laughs> I have a tech crew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's your wife, right? <laughs> well, and my, my dog just left. So yeah, I'm, I'm now ball alone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't think anything helps. That would be okay. Do you have any idea how many people are going to join us? I think we have 21 registrants. Oh, wow. And lots of those are two people because lots of our members are husbands and wives or partners, spouses. Okay. That's what great. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening. We're not live, are we? <laughs> We're live. Everybody can see us. <laughs> oh, wow. We ready to start? We need to wait on some people to arrive. Yeah, okay. We're, um, we're just waiting a minute here because we have more people to log in. So. Oh, not hurry. I just was getting early too. To... Yeah. Well, I'm addressing that to our attendees who we can't see, but they can see us. I'm very bright. Let me see if I can. I now look like I have a shadow behind me. Going back to the light. Okay. It'll have to be what it is. Oh, you look good. We've got two chats already. Well, if it's not a large group, um, we'll go slow and if someone has a question, we can stop and look a little bit longer at a sculpture. Everybody should be able to hear me. We're just waiting a second to have more people log in. It's 6.02, you wanna go? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Collectors Club's first virtual guest artist event. I'm Mac Miles, the president of the Collectors Club. And what I wanna say is this is our 35th year. The club has been in, his, in existence since 1986. And behind me are uh, a couple of portraits from the current exhibit at the Clay Center that um, are the first purchases that the Collectors Club made in 1986. And those are um, two portraits by Samuel Lovett Waldo of Mr. and Mrs. Nathan Button. And the paintings were done in 1831. Um, if you'd like any more information regarding Collectors Club or events at the Clay Center, um, you can log on to theclaycenter.org. And there are, um, uh, we also have social media on Facebook, so you could visit there. Um, the reason that we are here this evening with our guest artist, Steve, is that 
the next Collectors Club project will be a uh, piece of sculpture commissioned for the new sculpture garden. And we wanted to familiarize ourselves and our members uh, a little more about um, sculpture parks, sculpture gardens, that sort of thing. And this is Steve's area of expertise. Um, so with that, I'm going to say our guest artist this evening is Steve Bickley. He's a visual arts professor, a sculptor, a fabricator, and has a vast knowledge of sculpture, sculpture parks, and sculpture gardens. And the last thing I have to say is at the bottom of your screens, you should be able to see the chat box or the Q&A boxes. And if you have any questions during our event, um, you can uh, ask those. I have some here. Some people emailed us. But um, without further ado, Steve, please uh, welcome. And uh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Here we go. I'm going to hit my share screen. Let's see. That's it. Can everyone see what I'm seeing? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when I was asked to, to put in context uh, your garden with some other gardens uh, around the country, uh, I was thinking about scale, uh, what are in those other museum gardens. Uh, a lot of people may have already visited these places. Uh, but I, I tried to select a few um, sites and locations and all the work uh, in terms of what I think is important when you guys think about your sculpture garden and, and primarily that was scale. So uh, the first place I thought that was very appropriate was the Hirshhorn. And I would imagine a lot of people have been to the Hirshhorn and it's a very beautiful, com comfortable setting. Uh, here these two people are looking at a calder, they're uh, right beside a Henry Moore. There's a Ellsworth, Ellsworth Kelly behind them and hiding behind that looks like a David Smith. So uh, you can see the scale of the sculpture uh, in comparison to the scale of, of the figures and, uh, and the environment around them. And uh, we'll see in a few minutes some shots of your garden uh, and uh, some other places. And, and think about the total, total environment, uh, how you fit in there, uh, what's your scale? What scale should the artwork be that's there? Uh, and then as we move through the slides, I tried to pick uh, a variety of uh, very famous artists, some artists that uh, are probably not known to very many people, uh, some local artists, so that basically you get a feeling of what uh, sculptors are working with and what their sculpture looks like uh, in, in terms of a, certainly an outdoor setting. So I certainly thought the, the Hirshhorn was a perfect uh, beginning uh, and, and they're about to redo the entire Hirshhorn garden, but this is a great place to start and, and think about uh, work. And of course, everyone's familiar probably with the Museum of Modern Art. Um, uh, and I'm thinking small, small in scale compared to some of the larger uh, sculpture gardens around the country. But again, uh, here's a pretty good crowd. Uh, of people and, and we can see, it's hard to see, there's no, I'm sorry, there's no work right here in front, but we can see a few pieces behind the trees there. Again, uh, thinking about scale and you see a few people standing beside a yellow uh, Anthony Caro there. Uh, it's probably the most visible. So um, when uh, you get a chance to come over and visit the sculpture garden, uh, walk around, think about uh, what size works should be there. Uh, and I think as we go through all these images, you'll see that most of the sculptors that are uh, presenting work outdoors are still working in a lot of traditional mediums uh, and certainly um, should be considered as well what the material is. So we'll move out of the Museum of Modern Art and we'll come to the Susan Runnan Meyer Garden. That's your garden. Uh, and I believe those are the tiles that are about to be uh, placed in the pool. Uh, and you can, from this view, you can see the pool, but you can sort of see the narrow strip uh, of landscaping and the uh, fencing that's in this one corner of, uh, of the garden. Here's another view, I think, looking down, looking down that, that sidewalk behind the pool 
and you see uh, a few of the areas where sculpture could be uh, placed. And then here's the, um, I guess there's gonna be performances, uh, music and other things on this uh, plaza that leads out into the garden. Uh, thanks for those images, Kathy. Uh, I like the light of the pool. Again, you can put yourself in perspective. If you haven't been to visit, you can see, you can see yourself uh, comparative to the environment around you. Here's the Virginia Museum's um, outside sculpture. This leads up to their official sculpture garden, but certainly you can see some works placed outside of the Virginia Museum, which I'm very familiar with because um, I've been there quite often. And, and you again see, uh, again, the scale and the placement uh, of these few works uh, as we think about um, your pool and what could be within the vicinity of the reflection pool uh, and at the Clay Center. This is another great place, a uh, little bit larger in scale, but uh, the Getty in Los Angeles is, is a wonderful place to visit. What a great environment. And I think um, what I'm interested in uh, and what I like to uh, experience, not only um, the sculpture, but I just enjoy the, the garden environment itself as a, uh, as a, a location, a uh, destination, a place where people can gather uh, just to be together in, in a beautiful setting. And it just happens to be beside the museum. Uh, of course, this is a, another good scale uh, work. This is a Henry Moore um, as you get off the train and go up to the, to the caddy. And, and I didn't know this until I started doing a little research. This is a sculpture garden that's at um, West Virginia uh, University. Uh, and um, looking at this garden, uh, there, there is no, there's no fence. It seems to be by the interstate. Um, but again, it's a, a walking path. Uh, and you can see here some works that are already uh, in a similar scale again, I thought, uh, as to what would be possible for works that would be located at the Clay Center. Um, I'm not familiar with these artists, but some of you may be familiar uh, if you've been up to, to West Virginia to see this. So now we're gonna go back into what I wanted to talk about and, and wanna keep emphasizing, I hate to say this, is, is scale. And now we have some, some people looking and questioning uh, what's this work of art? I'm not sure who this is. I don't know if it's a, a clay digger or not by William de Kooning, but it looks like it may be. Uh, so you want people to be able to at least get close to the artwork. Uh, and, and of course, you're, from what I could see from the um, images that Kathy sent, you're going to be able to, the viewers, the visitors are going to be able to have a really good uh, exchange with the works of art. And so when you select something, uh, you should always keep that in mind. People are going to want are curious. They're going to want to uh, be close to it. Uh, they're going to want this woman's reaching over there. Actually, they're going to want to touch it. Uh, and what we've seen already, this is another bronze sculpture by Tony Craig. Uh, and along with the Henry Moore, we saw a few minutes ago at, um, at the uh, Getty and the West Virginia. These are all metal sculptures. So casting metal, of course, is an obvious material choice for a lot of artists that, that uh, work and want to have their work uh, outdoors. So, um, but keep in mind, these materials are, uh, have their own integrity and people can touch. I don't know what the rules are gonna be, but someone's not always gonna be there to say, don't put your hands on the sculpture. And, um, but, I would consider that. So hazard, safety, it's always an issue. Uh, this doesn't seem to be very threatening, um, but yet uh, people are inquisitive and, and this is a great piece to come up and touch and stick your fingers in. Hey Steve. Uh, yes. We do have one question though. Okay. And I, hate, I hate to go back so far, but- uh, Oh, not a problem. Large head at the Virginia Museum. Who Do you know who the artist was? That's a Palenza. We're gonna see a couple of his works, I think coming up. He's okay. 
He's uh, one of the most popular artists working right now, uh, almost. Uh, and, and that's something we want to think about as we go through here. There's certainly this, this headline of artist work that you'll see uh, in all of these gardens. Everyone wants a piece of Palenza sculpture uh, in their collection now. So they've become very hot, hot items. Uh, and certainly uh, he's a very unique artist uh, to, to consider uh, and his works are, are, are very moving. The piece at the Virginia Museum uh, is, a, is a plaster or a, not a plaster, but a marble, marble resin um, sculpture. Uh, he does make actual marble pieces that are a little bit smaller, uh, but the larger ones, the large scale pieces that are similar to those heads are either cast iron or the um, resin plaster. So now we're, we're actually across the street from this, several Palenzas, but this is at the Art Institute uh, in Chicago as you move uh, into the Millennial Park, uh, which is adjacent to the Art Institute. And again, <laughs> another Henry Moore, I don't know if I'm in love with Henry Moore or not, but certainly a lot of people are familiar with Henry Moore, but I was picking uh, these pieces because of the scale of the, the, the two women right there uh, looking at the sculpture. So again, you can uh, some have some idea of, of what presence is all about. Uh, and I do believe, I think I have a Palenza in here. I had a had one coming up. So we'll keep going through and see some more. This is uh, John Van Alstein and I put him in there. I have a couple of shots with artists in there so that you can get a, a better feel of exactly uh, what the, the sculpture looks like, its shapes, its forms. Uh, it's, it's very difficult when you're confronted with scale and making sculpture and you move from inside the studio here, which looks quite large with uh, John standing there beside his piece, but uh, sitting out in a field, uh, these sculptures become uh, very small. And, and places like Storm King and other large sculpture gardens, uh, the artwork there is massive. Uh, and I didn't include um, a lot of those uh, pieces in this because I didn't think that uh, it would be appropriate. You couldn't put the large Paley that you have out front beside the reflection pool. It just would be uh, overwhelming. But um, so that, that's again, while we're looking at the types of works their scale, their presence, how they're able to uh, attract your attention uh, and still be part of the vocabulary of the artist. John works with uh, metal and uh, these stone uh, attachments uh, to the pieces. Another interesting artist that a lot of people have seen lately is Stephen. Uh, Tubin and, and he does the root sculptures. So I, I think what I've tried to do as we move through, you'll see um, various um, forms of sculpture. Certainly uh, there's a, a natural group of sculptors or sculptures that are more abstract. Uh, they're figurative artists. So I think once you uh, delve into uh, any, uh, any art form, you're going to find that uh, it, there's a, an endless list and an endless uh, variety of, of work to, to select from. And if everyone um, got the email and went to the International Sculpture Center, uh, it's the largest uh, group of, of sculptors, uh, and just start looking. You can spend hours looking and trying to um, pick, a, pick a favorite artist. But this, a lot of his root sculptures, you can walk underneath. And so they're spatially, they can uh, take up more room, but be less uh, intrusive, uh, if, if that's a good way to think about looking at Steve's work. This is um, a regional artist. This is Carl Billingsley. I think he's now in Georgia, uh, but uh, he's not um, super famous. He's not at the Hirschhorn but certainly uh, a competent sculptor, a uh, very impressive piece. So I, I think that um, the artists that you select uh, don't have to always be uh, big name artists. 
but there are certainly competent artists that work in a similar scale or a large enough scale, uh, and their work uh, is equally uh, as interesting as some of the artists that would get more attention. But again, this is another, uh, I like the idea of the um, concrete pedestal there. One of the things that um, you might wanna look in the garden is, it's not only when you pick a site, but how would you, um, how would you arrange that Skype site, landscape that site? Um, how would you present the work? So just selecting a sculpture uh, because of its shape or form, or are you like an artist? Uh, you have to think about uh, where's that gonna be presented in the garden? Uh, what's necessary uh, to either enhance the sculpture or complement the sculpture? In this case, it seems the, the, the concrete base is uh, very important and people can uh, walk up to it, sit around the edges uh, and experience the work. Um, the grounds for sculpture uh, in, in New Jersey, Princeton, uh, does a great, a great uh, integration of the landscape and uh, its sculpture collection so that the, the landscaping uh, is equally uh, significant as the sculptures. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how important color might be in these outdoor pieces? Uh, I have some more artists coming up that are very colorful, but I think uh, what we've looked at so far, that's a good question. Uh, most of the works that we've seen thus far and, and uh, we think about material and we think how those artists work with material. This is a Corten sculpture, which obviously rusts to a nice uh, purple, purple brown patina, doesn't need any maintenance. Uh, John uses color in his sculptures to offset the organic color of the stone. Uh, so I think uh, as, as we look at a lot of these works, uh, sometimes they are monochromatic. There are artists that do some, some more ultrachrome or, or work with color a little bit more uh, in their work. Uh, and I tried to find a few artists that do that. Uh, you have to think about um, what that material is going to what's going to happen to that color uh, over time. And a lot of a sculpture in, in the past that's been metal and stuff, uh, artists use color and, and you do have to think about maintenance. Uh, maybe in 10 years, 15 years, uh, you may have to repaint that sculpture. So um, color is important. Uh, it's not only important in terms of an artist using it as part of their, their visual statement, but also uh, color that's either applied to the material or the material's inherent color itself. So that's why we see traditional things like steel, bronze. Uh, we're gonna come up on some marble sculpture. Uh, all those uh, materials that are, are very um, common and very um, everyone's familiar with uh, because those are materials that have proven over time to, to endure the elements and uh, remain outside uh, without uh, a lot of care or, or maintenance. That sort of answer your question there? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, but yeah, that, that's something that as, as we move through the slides, um, think about color and think about the material. Uh, this is, uh, get right to that, this is Ursula von Reisen and she works primarily in wood. A lot of people are probably familiar with her wooden sculptures this is one of her cedar sculptures. The sculptures are uh, cut with a chainsaw and they're very aggressively um, almost gnawed at, but this is a bronze casting from one of her wooden sculptures. So um, uh, I haven't seen too many of the wooden pieces outside only because they probably won't last a lifetime, but uh, she is a very interesting uh, artist working right now and uh, the, trans, the translation from the wood to the bronze and the coloring here, the very organic coloring uh, doesn't seem to lose any, any of the effect uh, in the change of material. So uh, again, I think back to what we were just talking about, the color is very important uh, and certainly uh, she chose these colors, I'm sure in a close relationship to what 
would be a more organic palette uh, considering her, her wood sculptures. And then we'll, we'll go back in time and, and most everyone's probably familiar with Alexander Calder. Um, Princeton has um, five or six Calders all around. Someone must have been a Calder collector and gave them all to Princeton. Maybe we could borrow one back for a little while. But again, these are smaller scale uh, Calders and, and certainly again, thinking about um, uh, the sculpture up against the background, up against the buildings in the back, because um, that will be, uh, that'll have an effect. The environment will definitely have an effect on how people view the work and how intimate is it. And, and um, the work has to either uh, work within the environment or compete against the environment. We'll see some work in a little bit that actually competes with the environment. And we'll get some idea of, uh, again, this very similar Ursula. This is William Tucker. He's an English artist um, uh, and a little bit out of our uh, scale in terms of what uh, is at the, uh, the Clay Center. But I'm trying to, to show a variety of works that are um, relevant right now as, as you travel around or you, as you read and, and uh, so he's an he's a artist that's being exhibited more. And this, this is a clay sculpture that again is cast in bronze. Hmm. Very similar organic form. I'm not sure where this young man is. I wanna say he's in Tennessee, um, but I gave some, some sites for everyone to look at. There's the, um, Mid-South Sculptors, I think he's part of that group. Uh, there's the Tri-State Sculptors. There's um, Sculptors Must, um, we have more fun together uh, as a social unit. So there's a lot more sculpture organizations I'm sure that I'm not sure of. I did see that the uh, Charleston Artists Alliance is mostly painters, not knocking on the painters or, or a group, but um, there are several regional uh, sculpture organizations uh, in which um, uh, I'm part of the Tri-States group. Uh, they get together every year or every two years. They have workshops. The public's invited. Uh, you don't have to be a sculptor, uh, but there's always an exhibit. There's always dis, um, displays. It's a great social event uh, for artists to get together. Uh, and, and this is a regional artist that uh, is is uh, uh, does interesting work. I, I threw them in there. Now we can we can go now. We can jump from Tennessee back to Chicago. Uh, this is a very interesting artist. He's still working. This is Richard Hunt. Again, I, I think now that I'm looking at these again myself, I, I picked a lot of organic uh, works. I guess maybe because I think. Uh, there, there's those egg, organic forms work well in a garden setting, but I thought this was a very good scale um, and an interesting uh, work. This is someone I'm very familiar with. Again, this this is a, a Beverly Pepper. Uh, again, this is a nice scale. Uh, you can see it's it's in a great setting, uh, but a, a piece like this. Um, uh, it, it, she makes works that are also a lot larger, uh, but uh, again, moving from the uh, organic to more mechanical or, or a, a minimal form, uh, I think we can uh, put her up there as one of the leading artists that are working in outdoor sculpture. Now there's gotta be something for everyone. Uh, certainly uh, I, I get a little, laugh when I look at this, it's, it's uh, I, I can't remember, I think it might, it's just a French artist. I'm not sure, uh, but I thought uh, this would definitely um, attract uh, an audience or, or people would definitely want to talk about that. So I think uh, there's no, no rules as to what could be in the sculpture garden and certainly would not want to uh, restrict it to any kind of 
of theme or it just has to be abstract or it has to be figurative, but um, we have to think about everyone uh, coming to the sculpture garden. And uh, certainly uh, I think I enjoy this for the humor. I think uh, our younger audience might like it like kids. So it would be a, um, interesting to have a variety. This is an <clears throat> another, um, I'm not sure where this is, I'm, but this is another regional artist from one of the um, sculpture groups. Again, a, a nice scaled piece, uh, looks like in a courtyard or, or outside in a, in a park area uh, in, a, in a downtown. So um, similar environment to the, the clay court, uh, the clay center uh, environment and juxtapose to someone that's uh, probably not as well known as, as Beverly, but uh, makes competent work. Uh, I, I did see that there's some wall space uh, underneath the performance stage, uh, but um, this is, I think this is a Flavin, but, but um, we have to think about if there is any wall space, uh, artists like to use that wall uh, and again, uh, back to your question of color, uh, the, I do enjoy this very, I probably picked this after I saw the reflection pool, the lights in, around the reflection pool uh, are a, a very good artist, artistic statement as well. We have a couple more questions. Okay, great. Um, what, what do you think of kinetic sculpture? Um, I'm trying to think there's a lot of artists that are doing kinetic work. Um, I'm not, I, I, I'm trying to, I don't know if I picked any uh, of those um, from that group that are in here, but uh, uh, certainly kinetic sculpture outdoors in the environment. There are a lot of artists that are making mobiles that are up in the air. So anything that is moving and kinetic uh, is definitely uh, a crowd pleaser, as it were, only because it's not static. I think everything we've seen up to this point is static. I think Alice Acox, Alice's pieces here definitely are static, but do uh, lead you to think that there is some movement happening here. So I'm, I'm not opposed to kinetic. Uh, I just, um, I'm trying to think if there's an artist regional artist close by that does very interesting kinetic work. Uh, his things are in stainless steel, but. Uh, we just got a new piece here at our Civic Center and I forget the artist's name. Um, it's essentially a tree, but right. all of the branches um, move. Awesome. And spin and it's a lovely piece. Right. I think about Ricky, I think some, some of the older artists that uh, uh, have movement in their work, Snelson, Ricky, George Ricky's probably uh, more well-known or historical figure, but no, kinetic is definitely a, um, there's a large group of kinetic artists that are um, out there. So no, I, I, I'm, I'm open to everything. Um. We have one more question here. Why do you think collectors might be more interested in collecting two-dimensional work rather than sculpture? Sculpture breaks, sculpture. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll tell a quick story. I have a friend that worked at the National Gallery in DC. And the very day they installed a Martin Purrier, if people are familiar with Martin Purrier sculpture, is almost like a hummingbird tongue that, that uh, comes out of a wooden shape and goes out about 10 feet. And, and the very day they installed it, someone, sounds very classic, but it's very true, backed right into it and broke the stem off. So, <laughs> so the, the, there's maintenance required with sculpture uh, and uh, it, it, it does require space. So I, I think that uh, sculpture is not as, as um, collected as, as much as painting, but uh, that's, a, that's up to the 
that's up to the the collector. Right. That's not to say there's not some great collections. There's a I've been working on a collection up in in DC, uh, and uh, but has several hundred acres of land to put his sculptures. So, but I think most museums, I, I think it's, it's uh, sculptures become a much more prominent art form in the last several years. I think only because of a lot of new, just like you did at the Civic Center, there's a lot of public interest because a sculpture can go outside. It can actually engage the public much more. So I think people are becoming much more familiar with uh, sculpture as a form, as an art form, and uh, cities and towns are always uh, it, it's it's a new thing. There's a sculpture sculpture walk, a sculpture tour uh, everywhere. All the little towns around us uh, in this area have had uh, sculpture. They call them sculpture tours, uh, sculpture exhibits that are up for a year. Um, so um, it's becoming much more part of of a community and certainly of the art community as, a, as an art form that can, um, people can be exposed to and not necessarily have to be within the confines of the building. So um, I think sculpture's uh, doing very well these days as far as getting some recognition. If that's I did, an get, the, I did get the name of the kinetic sculpture, uh, sculpture, uh, for our recent piece, his name's Harry McDaniel from Asheville, North Carolina. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, that's who I was thinking about, yes. So. Just unveiled that piece about a year ago or maybe a little more. So no, I, I think I think we can find uh, any form of artwork and once we start looking and open the door, um, the, you'll be overwhelmed with, with what's out there. Uh, and, and what people are doing. What I, I was trying to do is to, uh, we'll move on. Here's Jim Searles. Uh, I was trying to, to um, go through what uh, other museums, what collectors have out there uh, in their collections uh, and, and not so much um, as, as public art pieces as it were. So I think a, a lot of times uh, there, there's a line between what's uh, the public art and what's uh, museum art. Right. That, or those two different those two different environments can can um, can define a little bit uh, the different types of work uh, that would be appropriate uh, for different spaces. Right. That th this kind of relates to one of the questions that I got earlier about whether or not um, sculptors uh, like to work with the commissioning process or whether they'd rather have uh, the freedom of a uh, one person exhibit. Um, kind of the strings attached was the uh, stumbling point. Well, I, I think what's happened <clears throat> certainly in the last 10 years is just uh, what you did at, at the Civic Center. There's many more projects and many more people that are wanting art incorporated into new architecture, new buildings, uh, and certainly the percent for the arts uh, has become much more of a prominent um, uh, RFQ, if, if, if that's the right word out there. There's requests for art that uh, involves the public much more. Our artists that do work uh, in the public uh, are, are, are there a very integral part and I certainly think that um, Marie Gardner's the the glass the tile piece uh, that you've already uh, undertaken is is a good example of an artist that works uh, well with the public and, and can integrate that aspect into their work. Other artists, like I think, like we're looking at right now, Jim Searles uh, is on his own course of individual. Uh, pursuit of form and uh, making uh, his work. And, and I think uh, that what happens is uh, artists become popular or important or uh, start to uh, gain a reputation 
uh, and other people want a, a work by that artist. So there's, there's certainly a, a bit of a division there between artists that are just working in their studio, creating their own work, uh, and then perhaps having the opportunity to make larger works, which would then be more appropriate in a public setting. And then there are artists that just strictly want to work uh, with the public in a, in a much more public vein and have work that, that's out there in the public realm. So I think there is a, is a distinction in, in those sort of two artist groups, if, if that's uh, something to be thinking about. Uh, and I think it's really uh, about the environment, the environmental setting. Uh, so uh, there's, there's hundreds of uh, public artists now, uh, and it's become a real, a, a real profession. Uh, a lot of times uh, when I think about some of those works, I think about those works being uh, not so much commercial in the sense that it's uh, selling a commercial, but uh, a much more appeals to a much broader audience. Uh, if you go to the museum, uh, sometimes you have to scratch your head. You have to think about uh, why is this artist important? Why are they significant? What makes them different than uh, other artists? So I, I think you have to think about what, um, what kind of work do you want, you know, uh, to be part of, of a collection. And, and there are two, uh, there's some distinctions between uh, sculptors that pursue uh, more public things uh, and then uh, sculptors that just pursue their own work and the avenue of galleries, uh, the gallery route uh, as, a, as a way to um, be professional or, or make a living. And speaking of that, here's, here, here's our champion uh, Stuart Johnson, who's really uh, quite a character. He played the piano. He had sing to you. Uh, he uh, probably has the one of the best sculpture parks in the country, uh, grounds for sculpture. And certainly um, everyone's familiar with his work of uh, populist uh, everyday people uh, in everyday settings. Uh, and, and that was, was his pursuit. He, he was interested in uh, every, sculpting everyday people, everyday situations, not unlike George Siegel, we'll see his work in a minute, but certainly uh, Stuart Johnson has, has populated uh, the world with his work and uh, a lot of it's nostalgic, uh, like the, the 20 foot Marilyn Monroe or the American Gothic, that's also about 20 feet. Um, if, if people, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar uh, with his work because it's realistic. It's very recognizable. It's, it's uh, something everyone can relate to. And they're well, very well done. They're very well made. So Stuart Johnson uh, is, is a very interesting artist and certainly his creation for Grounds for Sculpture, which not only is uh, his realistic work, but uh, quite, a, quite a variety of of other sculptors as well. So, so I would recommend uh, a visit uh, to Grounds for Sculpture and you can see a little bit of, of everything uh, there. But uh, he's certainly a, a, an important figure in the world of sculpture and certainly in the world of public sculpture and outdoor sculpture. So with that in mind, could you comment uh, about your experience working with these world-renowned sculptors uh, uh, Beverly Pepper, Alavantra, Calatrava, excuse me. Well, <laughs> I, um, I guess when I was in undergraduate school, going to graduate school, uh, I went on a, a, I was going to go to graduate school at University of Georgia, and they had a uh, program in Italy. And uh, one of the footsteps into graduate school was to go on that trip. So um, but before I went to that trip, and this is what's important about the International Sculpture Center, uh, they put on sculpture conferences uh, every couple of years, every year. Uh, a bunch of us students had been to the sculpture conference in New Orleans and had seen uh, Beverly's talk there and, and, and met her. And so uh, 
uh, we were, we were in Italy one day and it was like, Hey, let's get on the train and go find Beverly Pepper. So sure enough, we did that. And, uh, 40 years later, I'm still working with Beverly. So, uh, as an artist, I don't think anyone worked as hard as she does, uh, at, at her work, but then that, that led to a, a opportunity over the years to work with other artists. I've worked with a lot of local artists that no one knows, helping them create their work. And then I worked for uh, quite a number of years with Cy Twombly, who's a very well-known artist. Uh, everyone probably knows Cy. Uh, when he moved back to Virginia and was going back and forth between Virginia and Italy, um, that was a great experience. But from working with uh, Beverly, and working with Marlboro, uh, got a chance to work and, and create some work with other artists. And about the last, last six years or, or so, I've been working with uh, Kyle Trava, the architect, uh, helping create his large sculpture works. And I'll, I'll show one of those at the end of the presentation. But each artist has their own personality. Uh, they have their own way of working. Um, I've yet to meet Mr. Calatrava. Uh, I've met all his kids. Uh, uh, Cy and I had a, a personal relationship and Beverly and I had a, a great personal relationship and knew our family and our kids. So um, I, I think that um, a lot of these artists rely on fabricators to, to make their work. Uh, and, and each artist has a different way of uh, working with their assistants or fabricators to make stuff. So I've been fortunate to experience quite a, a range of, of uh, in that respect of working with artists. Okay, great, thank you. And I only do it because I'm interested in it. So it's not something I, <laughs> I didn't search out to do it. So I think <laughs> this is a great piece to sort of uh, put in contrast with Seward's piece. Uh, he wouldn't mind at all. He had a great sense of humor, but but this is a, a, a an interesting new take on what everyone has a tattoo now. So I think th this is a great piece in terms of classical marble sculpture. But wait a minute, it has a contemporary uh, Japanese tattoo on it. So so I think um, certainly uh, I would hate to have uh, boring. If I, it was my sculpture garden, I'd hate to have boring sculpture throughout. I'd like to have a little mix of stuff. Right. So th this is a Martin Purrier piece. He's, he's very well known and interesting artist as well. But great sense of scale, all of his works, um, he makes very few really large works. So I think, uh, the scale of the work is, is is significant because as you experience the work, you, you sort of get to interact with it. And that's the great thing about sculpture. This is Ken Price, a uh, ceramic artist who later moved into making larger forms. Uh, ceramic uh, sculpture is the new rage. There are a lot of, uh, of new uh, contemporary artists working in ceramics. Ceramics, of course, can go outdoors if you're careful with it. Um, and, and these are artists, not ceramic artists, but artists that are using ceramic as the medium of expression seems to be the new, uh, a new uh, vein of artwork. I thought this was an interesting piece in terms of contemporary versus a historical Botticelli of figure. Another figurative artist. Interesting, because uh, as we move into some of these works that are coming up, we see artists that are using the computer and um, robots. Uh, digital marble carving is the latest thing. Uh, so I, I think that uh, a lot of artists are employing uh, the digital format with uh, the manufacturing uh, of work. Uh, and, and this is a really good example of a contemporary artist that's doing that. We'll see some Tony Craig's coming up, I think in a minute, 
it's sort of a, a forefront of using um, the computer, creating all the work on the computer, and then even using robots and stuff to, to help create your work. Who was the artist that did the tattooed piece? That is, I wrote that down because I just saw that. Fabio Viale. Okay, thank you. So, so um, I just thought that was cool. <laughs> so I put that in there. So a lot of people are probably familiar with Frank Stella. Uh, there's a good show at the Aldrich right now uh, of all of his stars. Uh, and he certainly has a huge factory and manufacturing operation uh, to create uh, a lot of his work. This is a, a, a younger, when I say younger, maybe 40, 45, a younger sculptor now that's, that's pretty hot, Aaron uh, Curry. Uh, he does some wild, colorful things. We were talking about color. Uh, he's really uh, uh, the uh, uses some wild and crazy color uh, in his work. Uh, so color does come uh, into play with with some artists, and he certainly takes it, uh, gives it a much more a fresh look, as it were, uh, compared to a, an older historical work that would just be red. Uh, so I, I like his work a lot and certainly should, should, uh, if someone's interested in color, should, should look at his work. He's a, he's a pretty hot artist now too. And then we'll get to the hottest artist working right now, which is Cause, K-A-W-S. Um, his real name is Brian Donnelly. And um, I'm familiar with his work um, about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the whole vinyl, more of a West Coast thing and New York City thing. Uh, several of these artists started making uh, vinyl toys and, um, and now he's become a, a, a super superstar. Uh, his small pieces are, are unaffordable, um, but certainly an interesting, here's a, a newer look. So you, there's a 30 foot bronze sculpture of this that just got uh, unveiled last year in New York. Uh, but you sort of see the obvious, not so much childlike, but the, the almost pleasant appeal. Uh, not that they're comical, but they sort of have that comical uh, look. But wait a minute, this is a little more serious. There's something going on here using these um, familiar, uh, more childlike or, or very happy uh, uh, images going on. He's holding the cookie monster. So this is bronze, but it looks. No, no like this is this is one of it. This is one of his plastic pieces. He just okay. did a. He just okay. did a a large. I don't know if I have that. I had a large. I had so many slides in here. I did have a large. Uh, I did have a picture of the large bronze one. Uh, but but this is more atypical of how he started out making the toys uh, in a smaller scale. Uh, and now he's moved into where they're giant wooden pieces and 30 foot bronzes and and uh, but but he's a he's a hot artist working now. And, and uh, if people are following the art world, uh, he's he's one of the new art stars uh, that's that's happening now. And then we'll go back down to uh, another regional artist making a, a, a nice work of art. Um, doesn't have to cost a half a million dollars um, for a small piece, but certainly a, um, one of the things that we have to think about is, is, is money. A lot of these top artists are just unapproachable as far as um, the, the price of, of art these days. This is an interesting Taiwanese artist uh, that uses um, cables. So um, like uh, elevator cables uh, to, to, as a medium. So um, again, an, and not only interesting form, but an interesting material to work with as well. And, and this is certainly a, 
uh, modest scale piece that um, a piece like this that would fit into the garden as a example. It's Bill Brown, um, another regional artist, but again, giving you some sense of, of scale and artists that are, are making work right within our region, uh, as well as well-known artists. Here's our marble tattoo guy again. I thought this was pretty wild. So it's not the Lancun that you're used to seeing if you were at uh, the Louvre or um, at the, in Rome, but uh, And this is a, again, another use of the same material in a more classical way. This is a Horace Varlow um, and a piece that if, if we think about a, another definition of public is you can sit on this, you can walk on this, it's a bench, um, it's the, the marble is very durable. So there's no um, fear of kids climbing on this, walking on this. So I think that um, you can find artwork that, that can also uh, require uh, an interaction with uh, a viewer. So uh, Horace's uh, big works like this were certainly meant to be uh, enjoyed. Um, probably not so much running and jumping on them, but definitely you could do that without damaging them. Again, I tried to put some more, some um, realistic artists that are working in there. Of course, realism is something everyone can relate to only because we're, we're humans too. So I think as a subject matter, uh, you know, abstraction, figurative, uh, kinetic. So there's, there's several um, categories that we can, we can look at sculpture in each one of those categories. And, and find artists that are interesting and, and compelling and would, would fit into the garden. Of course, this is a, yet another superstar, Richard Serra. I think uh, if anyone's ever experienced uh, one of his larger pieces, uh, walking in and walking around them, a um, little bit different experience than sitting on top of Horace's marble uh, bench uh, versus walking into a giant Richard Serra steel uh, wall that might fall on you. But again, the, the scale, I put, tried to find someone that had uh, some images that had uh, people in them. And again, sticking with the figurative theme, uh, this is another interesting artist. There's um, a good show at Chasm uh, Gallery in New York right now of uh, monumental sculpture. Uh, and it has a really good variety of artists working uh, not only from, um, I think the oldest piece is an African carving uh, to contemporary artists. I don't know if my kids would be afraid of this or think it was funny, but uh, she's a hot, another hot item out there in the uh, sculpture world right now. So is this guy, you've probably seen his work. He'll take a car and mash it into a ball. Uh, this is sort of like a whole house that's mashed into a ball. Um, but again, this, this is a, a great scaled piece uh, and certainly uh, new, uh, certainly contemporary, uh, not so classic. This is a, a, another regional artist. I believe she's from uh, Kentucky, Knoxville. I'm not sure, um, but uh, another figurative work in a, in a sense. Then there's Roxy Payne. There's a tree. This is, I guess, a tree form that's probably similar to the one that's in front of the Civic Center, um, but um, Roxy's the, the tree guy, him and Tubin are the, the tree and root uh, people out there in the art world. 
Um, so I'm sure a lot of people have seen these. I tried to pick work that was very familiar that if anyone traveled or went to other uh, museums and gardens, they would see uh, some of these artists work. So that's primarily why I selected uh, this group of artists, not, not to be, uh, only to be familiar so that if, if, if people were traveling, they would see works that were familiar uh, that were at other museums and gardens. And he's certainly um, everywhere now too. This I believe is a German artist, but again, I wanted to bring in um, some of the new art forms that are uh, available to a new younger generation, not so much a younger generation, but, but the making of art has changed with the introduction of the computer uh, and the things that are possible uh, with uh, adapting material and changing material uh, taking it from the computer uh, onto the um, fabrication platform and then actually uh, the work itself. Uh, this was an interesting uh, artist, I thought, that was definitely using new technology. And then I think coming up after this uh, interesting piece, again, miles back to color, it was hard to find artists that do, there's neon artists uh, so I think color uh, can definitely be uh, something to think about uh, so that when the garden goes dark at night, uh, I know that that was the idea behind the reflection pool and those blue lights that's definitely going to help enliven that environment. But there's nothing to say that there can't be uh, other works that incorporate light. Uh, and there are just like kinetic artists, there are light artists, there are neon artists out there working, that would be uh, another form to consider because it would uh, allow something to happen at night when it's dark. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was trying to look, this is Allison. I was thinking about one of her works. This is a wooden work. There's no reason um, she couldn't make a, 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 a casting. Uh, or again, I was thinking about color. Uh, her works are very colorful. I, I really like that psychedelic color look that she gets. Again, not a bad scale. Sorry, I put you in there, Allison, but I wanted to show the uh, size of the piece. And we just had a remodel of our Civic Center, and there are mm -hmm. a couple of Allison's pieces um, included in that uh, co co the collection there. The wall pieces, wall cutouts, or the uh, yes. sculptures? Yeah, the wall pieces are awesome. Again, moving on with that little theme here, I think these next group of artists are all working with, with uh, the computer and uh, digital uh, technology and uh, the, just the forms that you're able to create now uh, or have changed uh, what sculpture looks like. And there's a whole generation of uh, artists that are, are uh, using the computer more and more uh, as their sketch pad or as their final result. And this is probably one of the best known artists at that. This is uh, Tony Craig, um, whose work's pretty amazing. And again, is in most, him and Polenza are probably in every museum and garden that you can imagine, uh, but you recognize um, these forms. And that's why I try to, I try to pick things that were recognizable to everyone said, oh, I've seen that work or work similar to that uh, somewhere before. So, so I definitely wanted to refresh uh, that with what's familiar uh, out there in, in, a, in a garden setting or, or certainly in the sculpture world, uh, artists that are working right now. There's another larger bronze piece. He does some polished stainless steel pieces that are Pretty amazing too. Add another light piece. This is an interesting artist, uh, and I picked her work because it's it's not only ceramic, but it's it's um, as we move to the next slide, um, multiple forms, uh, and I think I was trying to bring some more uh, ideas that uh, 
doesn't have to be marble and steel, that uh, color can be. And there are artists that are working with color uh, out there. And I do feel that it's very important uh, and um, certainly uh, oftentimes not as boring as looking at a big bronze blob or a marble. And these are some little bit larger scale works that might be appropriate out there in the garden. Everyone's probably familiar with um, French artist, uh, uh, Mr. Curly Fry, but, but his works are equally scattered across the globe uh, and is now a, a, a another superstar artist that every garden, every sculpture garden and museum has got to have a, a, a detail. So um, again, a familiar artist and familiar artwork that people might reflect on or have seen it. Uh, this is another interesting artist, Nancy Rubin. Uh, oftentimes one of her main themes is canoes. So if you've seen uh, 50 canoes stacked together into a giant tree, it's a Nancy Rubin. Uh, this is a little bit smaller piece, uh, looks like from her carousel uh, series. Um, she ran around the country and just bought up all the uh, carousel horses and, and, and rides and, and uh, puts them together and, and again, uh, introducing a little color and change into outdoor work. Another artist everyone's probably familiar with, Deborah Butterfield. Uh, her horses, again, are everywhere. Uh, a very recognizable artist. Uh, the horse is a beautiful form. Everyone can relate to it. Um, and so she's super popular because of those attributes. Not only are they beautiful sculptures, but uh, uh, everyone can appreciate the horse. This is another could challenge your scale. And then I'll throw in a few here at the end. This is, I've been working more on the wall and drawing with my work. Here's a wall sculpture. But people are familiar when uh, I was showing with Callan, I was doing more of these cloud forms. Uh, and here's a larger cloud. And this, we're just beginning a series of these sculptures. These are Beverly's sculptures. We're making a set of these for Stanford, um, hopefully by the end of the summer, uh, they'll get a set of these. And then this is the latest piece that we just put up right before uh, Christmas, the large Calatrava in, in Chicago. There it is from the river. Wow. So there you go. Well, that's wonderful, Steve. Thank you so much. I took a bunch of the questions um, as we went along. Um, I do have a couple others. Uh, somebody asked about involving young people um, and create excitement for young people in our project since the, the, the way we plan on doing the project is kind of multifaceted. Um, any suggestions? And that's also one of the things that our collectors group as a whole is interested in is, uh, you know, new membership. Getting young people involved, that's especially right. uh, kids. Um, I, there, there, there's the, the, the piece you did with the glass is perfect example where everyone can participate in making a piece or contributing a element to it. And I think that um, there certainly are artists out there that can uh, work more with the community where they would, would invite them to either uh, present images or actually 
uh, more difficult in terms of uh, how would you have uh, young people uh, actually work on a piece that would then end up being in the museum only because uh, for the most part, part you're, are you're, you're working with tools, you're working, you know, the actual physical uh, involvement of making the sculpture uh, uh, it becomes difficult with certain materials, um, how you would introduce, you could do a nice little welding workshop where the kids could just weld some things together, whether that actually would become part of the piece or not would be, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you know, certainly if everyone made a, a small clay piece and then those clay pieces uh, were combined together to create a, a finished work. Uh, I think we'd have to do some research into artists that um, actually do that, that more of a participatory, as it were, uh, work. I'm trying to think of a, a young woman um, that collects recycled plastic and then does a plastic uh, workshop where you cut up the various recycled plastic pieces and then you create a work uh, from that. So that's, she does some exciting work. Um, the, a, a lot of times, um, there are planned out participatory work where there's much more direction from the artist, like in the glass tile, you know, you have a tile, make this certain tile, and then that uh, lets me incorporate all of those uh, pieces into one final composition. I, I think you could, could uh, address that with an artist or an artist's work that you like uh, I'm just trying to think of, of where you would go out and search for artists and, and their work that involves the community in, in terms of, a, 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 you know, uh, creating a piece. Right. A, lot of, a lot of public artists, uh, a lot of the um, requests for proposals for public art pieces is, is definitely that because everyone wants uh, them to participate. If they participate, there's much more ownership. And, and like you said, it does bring, uh, it broads that audience that comes to the museum and can actually see something that maybe their kids worked on or they, they had a part of. It does, it just has much more meaning. So, so the idea of having some contextual relationship to the sculpture is a good idea. Uh, I'm just not quite sure how you would, uh, I don't think you could write a, a game plan that would plug in an artist to make that happen right it'd right. have to some collaboration there how would how would uh how would you work with the community and how could you get them involved and then what that that final work looks like so it's, it um have to do a little more research and finding artists that that whose work is actually the culmination of a lot of hands mm -hmm. not just passed off to a fabricator or um, made in the shop, bigger. Is that is that a good answer? <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, I, I want. It's to very. I, I can understand. It's what everyone desires and wants, uh, and it's it's very difficult to get to that point and still have it look like uh, sculpture or, or you know look like art. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be there to witness the uh, welding uh, workshop for children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Teenagers. Yes, really. Teenagers. <laughs> Actually, um, when they when we worked on the tile for the fountain and that piece of sculpture, uh, she showed us how to cut glass. Had all the tools. It was pretty amazing, and there were yeah. young people involved. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a safe way to do things. Yes. Yes. I think we've answered all our questions, except for uh, there were a, a couple that came along like, oh, who did that red piece of sculpture? And we were far enough past it. Oh, Aaron Curry, uh, Adam Curry. That could be the answer. The wild painted, he's, he's a, he's a pop, hot item now too. He's very popular. He had a big show at, uh, at in our area, I think, oh, it's bound been a couple of years uh, had a very interesting show at the Atlanta High Museum. 
And I think he did a, a big show at the um, Met in New York. He filled up the plaza there with some of his wild pieces. So. All right. Well, oh, yeah, we do have what, what's that name again? James, Tur James Terrell. We had a question about James Terrell. James is getting old. We want to go see the volcano. He's certainly one of the most interesting artists out there. Um, I guess he could he could do a Kiva. I'm trying to think of what uh, the Walker has a very interesting piece that's not humongous that you can walk down in and sit and look and see things. But yeah, James Terrell is a very interesting artist. Uh, that would be super exciting to do a piece. Okay, well, I apologize that I wasn't so close to the microphone. I had um, some comments that people couldn't hear me, but they could hear you really well, Steve. So um, I think we are, I see one other little chat here. And is that the one from Nina? Yep. Sorry about me, that, Nina. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you so much, Steve. Um, we couldn't have done this without our tech crew here at the Clay Center and your tech crew there at home, your dog and your wife. Um, so we're thrilled to have had you here. Um, this will be available soon uh, on YouTube, on YouTube, so that somebody who might have missed it or wants to rewatch or recapture something, uh, they'll have that opportunity. So. Uh, thank you again. It was great to work with you on this, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you, uh, getting to meet you in person, and have a glass of wine at uh, Callan and Mimi's house. Okay. Well, now that you've peeled back the skin on sculpture and you start looking, it's it's a never-ending journey. There's there's a lot of sculpture out there these days. Right. That's and I'm more than happy to help. Okay. So. Well, thank you so much. Good to have you here. Well, thank you. And and somebody just uh, okay texted their clapping so oh. <laughs> thank you for that all right well we'll see everybody soon we'll be in touch um and thank you again not a problem okay thank you. have a good evening you too bye